Good morning. My name is Joel. I'm the minister at New Street Christian Reformed Church. Welcome to our online worship service this morning. Near to the end of the service, we're planning on celebrating communion together, so make sure you have uh, some bread or a cracker and something to drink as well. But we start with an invitation from God to us to worship. So hear these words of God from Psalm 150. And after we hear these words, we'll respond in song. Psalm 150, verse 1, 2, and 6. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Breath me. 
another way we worship is by giving. We give money. We give our tithes and our offerings. Our deacons lead us in our giving, and they source out and find ways to, to give and to serve. Here's a message from our deacons. Uh, from the deacons, hello to all listening to this taped message. Deacons want you to know that even though we're not able to receive your gifts as we normally do on a Sunday morning, we're so thankful for the continued financial and prayer support we are receiving from our church family. It allows the deacons to continue our work of mercy in our church community and our community of Burlington. Your deacons have been financially supporting Wellington Square Meal Bags Program, our local Salvation Army, and Burlington Food Bank throughout this pandemic. Numerous members of our congregation are also faithfully committing their time to support these causes. It's heartening to see these organizations working so closely together as they reach out to those in our community who struggle to get the basic needs of food, shelter, and clothing. The needs are particularly large during this time of the COVID pandemic. Thank God for the compassionate leaders of these organizations and the way they mobilize caring citizens to do such amazing works of mercy. Thanks again for your past generosity. Please continue to give generously to these food programs because as long as the virus is, under, is uncontrolled, this level of need will be with us. As noted in the bulletin, today's designated offering is for World Renew. We are living in a time when racial inequalities and injustices are being exposed and churches are challenged to find their voice to speak gospel truth into a very difficult conversation. World Renew is lifting churches in prayer, asking that God will provide courage and insight that helps to promote healing, reconciliation, and justice. We rest in faith and assurance that God will equip his church. Our church can shine the light of Christ for the marginalized by giving generously to World Renew's conservation agriculture programs in Tanzania and Kenya. Our partnership with Canadian Food Grains Banks is helping equip farmers with the training and tools they need to achieve food security for their families and communities. And every dollar donated is generously matched by three to one by the Canadian government. May I now lead you in prayer. Dear God, we're thankful for financial gifts offered by our congregation in support of World Renew as they work on our behalf to provide help to the marginalized in our world. We also pray for Wellington Square Meal Bags Program, the Salvation Army, and the Burlington Food Bank. We ask that the gifts generously given by this congregation be a blessing for the important work of mercy they provide to those in need in our community. In Christ's name do we pray, amen. May God bless your giving. And next week's offering will be for Redeemer University. So we come to a time of prayer. Now we're going on the road again to pray, sort of like an extended prayer walk. Last week, we were in the church sanctuary. This week, we're here at beautiful Lake Ontario. You know, God is known through creation and he is also glorified by it. Let's pray. You are the Lord, you alone. You've made the heavens and all their hosts, the earth and all in it, the seas and all that's in them. And you preserve all of them. And the host of heaven worships you. You, Lord, are indeed Lord of creation. And you are also Lord of our lives. And so we pray, Lord, that you would bless our works of service, that your name would be hallowed and glorified. And uh, for those of us whose lives are getting stagnant, we pray, Lord, uh, that you would revive us through your spirit. We pray these things in your name. Amen. It truly is beautiful out here. Now, if we turn around again, if you get motion sickness, uh, just close your eyes for a moment. Here we go. All right. So there behind me uh, is the hospital, Joseph Brandt Hospital. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, you... Uh, meet our needs and we're so thankful to uh, live in this community that has such facilities as this and you use that to meet our needs as well and so we are truly uh, thankful for it Lord 
Uh, we're thankful for the city and we pray that you uh, encourage its leaders and, uh, and give them wisdom and courage as they uh, lead still through this uh, pandemic, this time of, of COVID-19. Lord, we're thankful for the good health that you have given us and how you have kept us from any sort of outbreak of COVID-19 thus far. And we pray, Lord, for your continued protection. Uh, but Lord, as we stand here by the hospital, uh, we are mindful of those that are sick and hurting. We pray for uh, Rena, Lord. Uh, we pray for my niece who's going into surgery this week, not at this hospital, uh, but we pray for her. And Father, we pray for Al as he is in grief and mourning over the loss of his daughter, Wendy. Lord, we pray for Wendy's family. We pray that you would give Al and the family a peace that passes understanding. We pray that you give them hope for the future. Lord, be near to them at this time. Be their rock. Amen. We have prayed uh, together the first part of the Lord's Prayer that God's name would be hallowed, that his kingdom would come, uh, and that he would provide for our needs. Uh, and now let us uh, pray that last part of the Lord's Prayer now as well. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would forgive us. And we pray that your forgiveness and your grace and your mercy that comes to us would be evidenced in our lives of forgiving one another. Help us to be gracious with each other, Father. We pray that you do not lead us into temptation, that you keep us far from evil. And we pray these things uh, in your name, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We'll see you back there. We are continuing on in our series on Jonah today. However, uh, our scripture reading does not come from the book of Jonah. It comes from the Gospels. We're actually reading uh, two texts, one from the Gospel of Matthew and one from the Gospel of Luke. So let's start in Matthew. Matthew chapter 12, starting in verse 38. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now something greater than Solomon is here. And we'll read this same story from the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 11, starting in verse 29. As the crowds increased, Jesus said, This is a wicked generation. It asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites, so also will the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise at the judgment with the people of this generation and condemn them, for she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. And now something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. The first uh, problem that we want to sort out when we come to this task, text is, so what's the sign of Jonah? And in the Gospel of Matthew, it looks as if the sign of Jonah is uh, the fact that he spent uh, three days and three nights in the belly of a fish, and so too will Jesus uh, 
spend three days in a tomb. According to Luke, with his account, it seems that the sign of Jonah was Jonah's preaching to the Ninevites. And just as Jonah brought the word of God to the Ninevites, so to Jesus, the Son of God, brings God's word to these people. But we'll get back to that later. Uh, because the problem in the story is that they were asking for a sign in the first place. In Matthew, it was the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who asked for a sign. In the Gospel of Luke, it was the people, the crowd. And Jesus, in both, in both stories, says, no, you don't get a sign. Now, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with asking for a sign. But, ah, come on, right? Jesus, uh, just before this story has healed a demon-possessed man who could not speak and could not see. And right after that, they ask for a sign. Jesus has had this ministry of, of power and of miracles. So what do they need another miraculous sign for? You get the idea that a sign is not going to change their mind. It's not that they are you know, so willing to believe if only there was enough proof. It's just rationalizing their unbelief and giving them a, a built-in excuse. And I think we see that in uh, a number of arguments from atheists today. It reminds me of a story that Jesus told about the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man, near to the end of the story, ends up in hell, and he's talking to Father Abraham. And he begs Father Abraham uh, to, to warn, let him go back to earth, so the rich man might warn his brothers not to be so sinful so they don't end up in the same place that he is. Abraham uh, says, no, there, that, that's not going to work anyways. But the rich man persists, and he says, No, Father Abraham, if, if someone goes to them from the dead, then they will repent. But Abraham disagrees, and he says, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone should rise from the dead. Asking for a sign. Asking for a sign gives us insight into their spiritual condition. We see their, their stony, stubborn hearts and the resistance of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus calls them an adulterous generation because they cannot see the good that's right in front of them. And instead, they, they look in, in other directions and they gratify themselves in, in different ways. And he doesn't let up. Jesus keeps at them. He calls them a sinful and adulterous generation. And he says, what's more is that on that last day, pagans will condemn you, right? And Jesus contrasts the response of, of Gentiles with these religious people, these religious leaders, right? The Ninevites have a better response than the skeptical Pharisees and teachers of the law. Uh, the queen of the south, the queen of Sheba, coming all the way from, from Africa, she traveled so far just to hear Solomon's wisdom. Now, the Ninevites did not need to listen to this foreign prophet, yet they did heed his word. And the queen of the south did not need to travel all that way, but she did. And how much more attentive should the Jewish people and the Jewish leaders be to Jesus, one who is so much greater than Jonah and so much greater than Solomon, a greater prophet, uh, a greater king, how much more then should they have uh, an appropriate response? 
And on that last day, religious people will stand beside the Gentiles, the pagans. And the religious people will be the ones who are dishonored. They will be the ones who are condemned. Now, when I was reading the text, there was a phrase that really jumped out at me, really grabbed me, and it was the term, this generation. This generation. It's arresting. Because while Jesus was talking to the people of his time and saying, this generation, we hear these words, and when he says, this generation, we can't help but apply it to us. This is our generation. And indeed, we'll be there too at that last day. And we'll be standing judgment. And I wonder who might condemn us and what for. And so it's good for us to see what we can learn here. One of the things that we notice is that we ask for signs. Sometimes when we pray, we we lay down the fleece, so to speak, right? And say we're being like Gideon, as if that's a a good role model and, and a good thing to imitate. We ask for signs from God to make it easy on us. We ask for signs so we don't have to decide things. And we use uh, circumstances. We use uh, doors that open, we'll say, to decide for us. And certainly, God can arrange things. And that's what uh, one of the themes of Jonah, as a matter of fact, that God can arrange things and he can arrange circumstances. And he sometimes does, but we cannot always use circumstances as the voice of God. Right? The Apostle Paul, in his ministry, uh, in the book of 1 Corinthians, uh, he writes that he was going to be staying in Ephesus because a great door for effective work had opened up for him there in Ephesus. And so he was going to stay in Ephesus. Now in 2 Corinthians, he writes again and says, there's there's a door that's been opened for work, a ministry in Troas. But I'm not going to stay. I'm going to leave. Paul did not use open doors. He did not use circumstances to discern God's will. We need to be careful in asking for signs. God is not our pet. He is not our genie in a bottle. Signs uh, are for the weak, the immature, the unbelieving. We have the Holy Spirit that God has poured out on us. We have the, the Word of God. And so pray and discern and count on and decide. Pray, discern, and decide and and count on God's faithfulness. And if you do happen to get a sign, be, be thankful and keep on growing. Another thing that we glean is that we can be like the Pharisees and the teachers of the law in that we can be stubborn, right? And so we need to take a look at our life and see how we might be resisting the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we need to ask the Spirit to convict us of that, how we might be resisting the gospel of Jesus Christ and how we might be resisting his mission in the world. And so what keeps you from following and responding. Perhaps it's the way you are set in your political views. Because oftentimes we hold on to our political views, come what may, either left or right. And it comes to the point where we don't think that people on the other side of the political spectrum could possibly be Christians if they vote the other way. Or maybe you have liberal ideas on sex and sexuality and you will not give those up even if the gospel would want to reform your thinking there. 
Or perhaps you have a blind spot to injustice, or you are accustomed to wealth and you may not hear the call to give it up because we're so accustomed to it, because we are set in our ways. And this is where you need to do the work here. You need to uh, come to God in prayer and confession and asking the Spirit to convict you where your blind spots are, where your stubborn spots are. And it is interesting uh, that it, to me that it is the Gentiles in the story that condemn this generation. And I wonder, as we are being stubborn and set in our ways, I wonder what our generation of believers is going to be condemned for. What is the world going to hold against us? How are we going to be charged with, uh, you know, with fiddling while Rome burns? Is it environmental concerns? Is it uh, racism? Is it consumerism? Is it the huge wealth gap? Is it all of those things? What are we going to be condemned for by the world? And for that matter, forget the world. What about our children? What about the next generation? What will the next generation condemn this generation for? Maybe consumerism. We want to give the best to our kids, and so we want to buy lots of stuff, but perhaps later on they'll turn around and say, what were you thinking? Why all that stuff? What will we be condemned for? Now, back to the story. Jesus tells the people asking for a sign, he says, no, no sign will be given. But not really. There is a sign that will be given, the sign of the prophet Jonah. That's the only one. Now, what's that? What's the sign of Jonah? And how does it relate to Jesus? Because it says, just as Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites, so also will the Son of Man be to this generation. So things to consider. Uh, we might think it's the preaching of Jonah, because that's how Jonah went to the Ninevites. But preaching is not usually considered a sign. A sign is a something out of the ordinary that confirms, um, you know, it's, it's a miracle that confirms something. So perhaps it's not the preaching. And in the text, it seems that the sign is the person himself. But how does that work? Some have suggested that because Jonah is a sign that the Ninevites could see, well, it must be that while he was in the stomach of the fish, the stomach acids bleached his skin, and so when he came to the Ninevites, he was indeed a sign. They looked at him and were, and were startled at, at this amazing sight, this man who had been in a fish. Uh... But uh, other scholars, you know, have kind of debunked that, and we don't get any sense of that in the story either. Uh, it's also good to note that when Jesus is talking about uh, the sign, he speaks about it in the future tense. Uh, just as Jonah was a sign, so also will the Son of Man be a sign. It's going, it's going to happen. He is going to be a sign. And then there's also, in all of this, there's also an aspect of judgment to this whole thing, right? And so when we, when we take all of those factors into consideration and we ruminate and think about that, and, and here the Gospel of Matthew kind of spells it out a bit more clearly for us, the sign is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's, that's the sign. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mostly the resurrection. Anyone can get swallowed by a fish. It's a matter of getting spit out again. Anyone can die. It's a matter of being raised from the dead. So the resurrection is the sign of Jonah. 
that will be embodied by Jesus Christ. So Jesus' preaching and teaching aren't the primary reference of this sign, but both aspects, the resurrection and his preaching, are, are, are present in this sign because the resurrection points to God's vindication and his victory. But this vindication demands from us a proper response as well. The sign of Jonah is for us. And how much more of a sign is it for us on this side of Christ's death and resurrection? Right, you, you sense the movement, right, from, from lesser to greater. So first we start with uh, the Gentiles and their response. And if that was their response to Jonah and to Solomon, if that was their response, how much more should the response of the Pharisees and teachers of the law be? How much more should those present with Jesus, how much more their response should be, how much greater their response should be because they have Jesus right there with them? And then if we follow that, how much more, how much greater should our response be? Because now we see it from the, from the far side of the resurrection. All the Ninevites heard was a message of judgment, and they had seen a man that was thrown up by a fish. So the Ninevites had a message of judgment. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they had Jesus himself. We have grace that has been accomplished already through Christ's death and his resurrection for us. Whew. So don't look for more signs. We, we have that sign. Just, just look for the relationship with Christ. Don't look for more signs because what else do you need? We have the resurrection. So how do we know for sure that God has accepted Christ's sacrifice for our sins? How do we know that Jesus has the power of eternal life? How do we know that we will have eternal life in his name? It's all because of the resurrection. That's our sign. And so uh, we hear Paul's words from 1 Corinthians about the resurrection. If Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God, for we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But if Christ has not been raised then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, we have uh, all who have died believing in Christ are also lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are to be pitied more than anyone else in the world. But in fact, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. It's the resurrection that vindicates Christ uh, and his teaching. And it's the resurrection that allows for his mission to continue through us because his life is lived in us. His mission is worked out in us. And Jesus continues to resurrect in a way in the lives of those who believe in him. That's the sign you need. And that's the sign that we see at the Lord's Supper. And so let's come to the table again. Uh, we will sing as we prepare our hearts and prepare our tables. His hands, His feet. 
on that first resurrection day, two disciples were walking from Jerusalem to a town called Emmaus, where they lived. And as they were walking and talking, Jesus came and walked alongside with them, although they were kept from recognizing him. It wasn't until they got home and had supper with him. Now, uh, I guess when they sat down for supper, they ate what they had. Whatever was in the kitchen. You may have a cracker and tea. I don't know. Uh, but they had some bread, and I would guess some wine. And they set the table, and then in Jesus' hands, it became a sacrament, a sign, a way of recognizing Jesus. You see, when he was at the table with them, he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and began to give it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. This is a sign for us, the sign for us. It is a sacrament. We learn from sacraments. What are sacraments? Sacraments are holy signs and seals for us to see. They were instituted by God so that by our use of them, he might make us understand more clearly the promise of the gospel and might put his seal on that promise. And this is God's gospel promise, to forgive our sins and give us eternal life by grace alone because of Christ's one sacrifice finished on the cross. God knows our faith is weak, and so he gives us this sign, right? And through this meal, he reminds us and assures us that we share in Christ's one sacrifice on the cross and in all of his gifts. And he does it in this way. Christ has commanded me and all believers to eat this broken bread and to drink this cup. And with this command, he gives this promise. First, as surely as I see with my eyes the bread of the Lord broken for me and the cup given to me, so surely his body was offered and broken for me and his blood poured out for me on the cross. Second, as surely as I taste with my mouth the bread and the cup of the Lord, given me as sure signs of Christ's body and blood, so surely he nourishes and refreshes my soul for eternal life with his crucified body and poured out blood. So, take and eat and believe that the body of Christ was given for you for the complete forgiveness of your sins. and take and drink and believe that the blood of Christ was shed for the complete forgiveness of your sins. Let's pray. Lord, we have proclaimed Christ's death and his resurrection until he comes again. Help us to live in that hope, in the assurance of Christ in us. Amen. And as you go from here to love and serve the Lord, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you. Amen.